Hello guys! Recently I've been talking about different language models like GPT-2 from OpenAI, Megatron from NVIDIA and Turing NLG from Microsoft. So Turing NLG was the largest model to date with 17 billion parameters that what I explained in the previous video and uh, it was truly a monster. But now comes even a bigger model because just last week OpenAI has announced GPT-3 with, uh, within this paper, language models are future learners, which I will explain in a moment. But this model has 175 billion of parameters, which means it's 10, 10 times bigger than Turing NLG, uh, which was 10, time, 10 times bigger than the largest uh, uh, GPT-2 uh, to date. So that's really crazy. I will link that in a... Uh, in a video, this this whole paper of them, uh, I've prepared a, a short summary what's going on uh, and why the paper is called like that. So uh, what they tried to do was actually build this large pre-trained transformer model which is able to do uh, different NLP tasks like translation or question answering without additional fine-tuning. So normally if you take a model like BERT and uh, you want to learn to, for example, teach it how to translate from English to French, then you need to provide more data to do that. And this GPT-3 is so big, then actually you don't, do, you don't have to do that. You just have to maybe uh, do, just indicate that you want to have a translation. And how would you do that? So actually, uh, you give us a prompt uh, the whole sentence like translate English to French cheese and you get fromage, fromage uh, in, in French uh, and similarly it works for other tasks where you simply explain what you want to get um, and you're getting that so uh, th there's also a great talk from Microsoft Build uh, where Sam Altman explains how they trained GPT-3 on code from GitHub and then started asking from, uh, for, for different functions about palindrome. So that's really crazy. Uh, I also give you a link to this video from Sam Altman down below, or you can just Google Sam Altman GPT-3 code generation, OpenAI code generation, you'll find it. Uh, that's really crazy and uh, uh, really exciting because uh, you're seeing that GPT-3 is able to provide new code uh, which is doing what you want it to do. Uh, maybe up to some little tweaks that you have to do uh, in between, but that's really great. Another kind of task that they tested GPT-3 on is, again, no fine tuning, no new data. Uh, you just want to have uh, this vanilla GPT-3 model doing different tasks on its own. And the ne next task is actually answering questions from general knowledge. Uh, so, for example, what is 48 plus 60, 76? And you get us the answer 124. So, this is basically another thing uh, which is really exciting. And all this is called basically zero shot learning because you give zero examples of what's going on. Uh, the paper is called Few Shot Learn, Few Shot, uh, refers to Few Shot Learning because. Uh, you can give a couple of examples to actually prompt the model in a good direction. So, for example, you would give something like uh, translate English to French uh, and then you give the example of sea otter translating to l'autre de mer uh, and then you give cheese and you expect that uh, it will come back with fromage. So, this is an example of one-shot learning because you gave one example. Uh, yeah, so, so this is really crazy when it comes to the scale of what, how you can do it and the authors expect that if you go farther along the way, so if you go to even larger models, uh, language models, then you'll be able to incorporate more of that uh, general knowledge, general question answering into the model. Uh, so that's really, really great. Uh, yeah, so, so actually if you go to the previous model, already Turing NLG is able to do that. Uh, to some extent. That was the, the model with 70 billion parameters. Uh, so uh, it was able to answer a question like when uh, the World War II started, who is the Queen of England, without any additional fine-tuning again. So that, that's the important point. Uh, 
so the, the greatest thing about GPT-3, it goes beyond that and is able to do some common sense reasoning, also with mathematics. So you're able to actually uh, give it examples like one plus two equals, and then you leave that and you put that as a prompt and you get three most of the time. So accuracy of or, 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 all this kind of tasks is something around uh, 86%, if I remember correctly, from the, from the paper from OpenAI. So that's already pretty good. It's like a, uh, you have a good um, press cooler doing all these tasks. So, so that's great. Uh, ju just one note maybe, it doesn't mean that the model is reasoning by itself. It just means that it understands really well how a language goes on. So there's still something to be done when it comes to automated reasoning. And for example, if you were to prove new theorems in mathematics, if you were to take research from archive and try to develop that, for example, in number theory, algebra, geometry, or stuff like that, then there's still a lot of work to be done because uh, there's really no reasoning on objects per se, it's the reasoning on the language and the probability of the next words coming through. Um, so general knowledge is great, but doing research is still far away from that. Another example so for this common sense task is ex filling in blanks in sentences. So for example, if you have a sentence like, uh, Alice was friends with Bob, Alice went to visit her friend, and uh, you have this blank space to fill in, then the correct answer is Bob. Uh, so this is something that uh, GPT-3 is able to, to do, again, to some, to some extent. Uh, yeah, so, so this is basically it for all the tasks. You can go to the original paper, I'll link you down below, um, and see all the other discussions around it. There are a couple of issues also on the edX side, uh, which is great. Um, if you look at the, the original paper, yeah, this is the, this is the paper, then uh, the contents looks like that. Uh, they explain how uh, what was the training data set. And uh, if I remember correctly, they take like 1.5 terabyte of data uh, of just text, which is amazing because that's a lot of text, uh, especially the text can be compressed and really like this doesn't weigh that much. So uh, if you were to take, for, for, for example, that many of uh, the amount of images, then that wouldn't be that much, but with text it's like, a lot, a lot of, a lot of text. Um, there are a couple of discussions around transformers they use and the whole, the whole process uh, of training, how much they took. Uh, basically, as with is the case with these models, it really at this level it's not something you can uh, probably repeat uh, with the the publicly available cloud uh, because uh, they use really several thousands of petaflops per day, uh, which means that you probably ha you you, ha you need to have access to like supercomputers to do that, so it's not something like you can play around. You can probably play around with GPT-2, the largest model, but already uh, I think even Megatron is hard to access from like if you were to buy publicly data uh, like access to the cloud. Uh, not saying uh, and then the monitoring NLG is out of reach, and then definitely GPT-3 is out of reach for. Uh, for, for, for people without supercomputers. Um, so that's an interesting point as well, how, how much you can use that uh, in a commercial space, because this is like a large discussion, how much actually of that, how much of that is going into commercial applications, whether you'll be able to uh, find good applications for that, or is it going to just stay in academia, plus maybe Microsoft will use that to some extent to, for example, power up Bing and different question answering uh, tasks, uh, which will be also cool. And probably, uh, maybe to some extent, you'll be able to access GPT-3 just through API and use that uh, as you see fit. Uh, maybe that's the best solution. You won't have to access the, the cloud by itself. And if those pre-trained models are good enough, then you can build on top of that API by providing new layers of neural networks, which is also cool. Like, uh, I would love to test that uh, for myself in, in content ties in what, uh, what I do right now, uh, but I, I don't expect it to be available. Uh, like I, I couldn't probably make it on a, on a, by myself right now. 
So definitely have a look, this is really exciting news just from last week. I think they haven't even written a blog post about it yet on the OpenAI website. Uh, so that's something to be seen yet. Uh, this is really, really exciting. So yeah, thank you for watching. If you like this content, please give me a like, subscribe to my channel and see you in the next episode.